So Aniruddha said he's very sorry, he's coming, he said the, the person who was supposed to do it, Manmohan, somebody called Manmohan didn't, didn't do it. So he's trying to do it himself and he said he would do it. So we have to wait for him. Anyway, we're on the ninth chapter, right? We were up to text number 26 and we were hearing about the offerings, how we can offer very simple things to Krishna. Patram pushpam palam toyam. We should understand these things are singular. A single leaf, a single flower, one single fruit, not difficult things. So what does Krishna want? Of course, he's not anxious for the offerings. He has many goddesses of fortune all serving him. But what he wants is, which is mentioned in the verse twice, Padram pushpam palam toyam yome bhaktiya pranashati tadaham bhakti uparitam. So bhakti is mentioned twice. So what Krishna wants is our devotion. Devotion, yes, Krishna. And he doesn't just want any kind of devotion, he wants pure devotion. He wants that pure devotion. Anya bilasita sunyam jnana karma jnana vritam. Right? That's pure devotion. Devotion which is not mixed with desires for fruitive activities or impersonal liberation. Now, one lady brought up a topic which is discussed, which is mentioned in the purport by uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur in his commentary. He mentions about the importance of cleanliness when you make your offerings. Srila Prabhupada taught us two principles are very important, cleanliness and punctuality. Cleanliness and punctuality are the important principles. So it's very important women, if you, women are going to do the puja, they must be clean. Huh? Maharaj, you are host now. Okay, I'm host now. Yes, so let me see if I can share the screen. Okay. All right, you got the screen, you can see. Yes, Maharaj. PowerPoint. Good. Okay, we're on, la this is lesson six, Raja Goyam. By end of this class, the student should be able to, what is our objectives? One, I present an overview of chapter nine, explaining the main sections and how they connect. Then identify the principles of pure devotional service with reference to specific Sanskrit verses from Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9. And number three, present the essence of Bhagavad Gita with reference to 934, the final verse of the ninth chapter. Okay, so here's a breakdown of the chapter. <coughs> so chapter began with the importance of 
hearing about Krishna. <coughs> Who remembers what was the qualification for hearing about Krishna? What's the qualification or disqualification mentioned in the beginning of the ninth chapter? Anyone remember? Not envious. Not envious, yes, very good, right. That's one quality. Any other quality? Hmm? Uh, did we speak about faith? Is that mentioned in the second verse, is it? Pure love, Maharaj. Well, is it mentioned in the first three verses? Did, did he speak about pure love? The second verse spoke about the purest knowledge, gives direct percent. Did it speak anything about the... Mm, doesn't really... What about the third verse? Yes, faith, important. Those who are not faithful in the path cannot, they return to the path of birth and death. So if we are envious and if we are not faithful, then we cannot, we're disqualified. We want to hear about Krishna. Hearing about Krishna, we must have the right attitude. If we're, if we're, if we hear, we think, oh, can't, oh, I don't believe it. Oh, Krishna picked up Govardhan Hill. I don't believe it. Oh, Krishna dances with so many girls in that forest. I don't believe it. Then, of course, we'll never understand. Or if we're envious of Krishna, of course, we're all envious of Krishna. That's why we're here, here in the material world. But we want to overcome that envy. Okay, so those are the qualifications. We shouldn't be envious and we should have faith. And then the second section, Krishna's Ajintya Beda Beda, relationship with the material world. That Krishna is inconceivably, simultaneously one with the material world and different from the material world. Right? And we heard about Krishna's uh, Achintya Shakti. So that's the second session. And then non-worshippers and worshippers, verses 11 to 15. Non-worshippers, who remembers the verse, an, an, an important verse? Who are these non-worshippers? Yes. So what? So what kind of people are they? They are fools. Yeah. <laughs> you can't just say the fools. <laughs> but, huh? Impersonalists. Okay, impersonalists, right? Mayavadis are impersonalists. And what about the worshippers? Who are they? Can you describe them? One word. Mahatma? Yes, right, Mahatmas, right. Right, Mahatmas. And what is the nature of the Mahatma? What's he doing? Uh, bhajanti, Ananya Vakti, Okay, so worshippers and non worshippers that we heard about the Mayavadis and the Mahatmas, the devotees. And then the verses 16 up to 25 was describing Krishna as the supreme object of worship. So we heard about the worship of Krishna. Actually, text 16 was 16 up to 19. There were four verses describing the worship of... Who remembers? Worship of the universal form was being described up to text 19. 
Krishna was described, he was saying things like, Oh Arjuna, I give heat and I send forth the rain. I am immortality, I am also death personified. Both spirit and matter are in me. This is like a description of Krishna's universal form. And then we came to text number 20. We heard about how people worship Krishna. They can go up to the higher planets. They can enjoy the heavenly opulence. And then text 22 was describing was describing devotees. Krishna described how he relates with his devotees. Remember text number 22, an important verse describing very high level of pure devotion. Can you give me the translation? But those who always worship me with exclusive devotion, meditating on my transcendental form, to them I carry what they lack and I preserve what they have. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, right. So, this is pure devotional service. This verse is describing pure devotional service. And similarly, also we heard text 14 was describing Mahatmas, that's also pure devotional service. The Mahatmas are always chanting my glories, endeavouring with determination. These great souls perpetually worship me with devotion, right? So text 14, then text 22, and then text 26 is also describing pure devotion. Offering leaf, flower, fruit, water, so directly worshipping Krishna by offering these simple things. And Krishna is pleased where there's genuine devotion. He doesn't mind so much what is the offering, but it's the mood which, which they are offered which is important. Of course, if one can offer more, then one should. But the point is made that even if one offers very simple things, he can get great benefit. Krishna will accept it and be very pleased. But if one can offer more, but we shouldn't be proud that I'm offering more. We should always remember that whatever we're offering, it's only by the grace of Krishna. That actually it's all His. So what we're giving to Krishna, it's not that we are off, I'm offering this to Krishna, but it's all Krishna's. I'm giving it to Krishna, it's His. I'm just simply His servant. So that is the mood of pure devotion. So 26 describes the mood of pure devotion and the chapter goes on to describe more about the glories of directly worshipping Krishna. So we'll be looking at that tonight as we go on. Let me see. We'll go on to the next slide. Okay, text 27. Now, this verse is not pure devotion. You can see there's no devotion mentioned. We're just giving to Krishna. Whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer or give away, whatever austerities you perform, do that, O son of Kunti, as an offering to me. Tat kurushva mat arpanam, mat arpanam, an offering to me, give it to me. So this is karma yoga. This is not bhakti yoga. You're giving something to Krishna. After you did the work, 
you give something to Krishna. Right? You cook and you offer it, you, you give it to Krishna. But the mood is that I'm, I'm giving this to Krishna, I'm giving to Krishna. Bhakti Yoga, we understand it's all Krishna's. I'm giving him what is his. So this is Karma Yoga. Krishna came, because he knows not everybody can do Bhakti Yoga, therefore they can't do Bhakti Yoga, let them do Karma Yoga. So Krishna comes down to this level of Karma Yoga and he says, whatever you do, just do it for me. So it's uh, an opportunity for people to take up some spiritual practice. We find karma yoga is some ways it's easier for people than bhakti yoga. If we ask people just to do bhakti yoga, that's difficult for them to just sit and chant. People like to work. Karma yoga means doing your prescribed duty. Your prescribed duty, for example, you're a Brahmin or you're a Kshatriya or you're a Vaishya or you're a Sutra. Whatever work you do, you do it for Krishna and then we give the fruit or some portion of the fruit, we give that to Krishna. So this is text 27. Okay, there's a quote here. Can someone read? In the beginning, one cannot take to pure bhakti yoga. Karma yoga means yat karoshi yat at asnasi yat jiboshi tadasiyat. That is karma yoga. Whatever you are doing, in the beginning, one cannot take to pure bhakti yoga. Therefore, karma yoga is recommended. Never mind whatever you are doing. In that position, you can become a devotee. Karma yoga. That is, people are interested with the different types of work. So therefore Krishna says, Yat Karoshi. Never mind whatever you are doing. So how it becomes Karma Yoga? Now, Purushvadat Matarpanam. You give it to me. Srimad Bhagavatam 1.8.21, Mayapura, October 1, 1970. Yeah, some people think they just do the work and they don't give anything to Krishna. They think, no, it's Karma Yoga. It's all, I'm doing Karma Yoga. They don't give anything to Krishna. <laughs> they just do the work. They say, oh, I'm doing my work. Krishna said I can do our work. But Krishna said you have to also give the fruit of your work to Krishna. All right? Remember the verse? What's the verse describing that? From the third chapter. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Mataji. Very good. Yes. You have a right to perform your duty, but you're not entitled to enjoy the fruits of the work. Never consider yourself to be the cause of the results of activities and never be attached to not doing your duty. Right? So, that's not karma yoga. If you work and don't give anything to Krishna, that's not karma yoga, that's just karma. <laughs> but when you give something to Krishna, then it becomes karma yoga. Okay, then we have text 27, 28. Okay, someone like to read this? Karmarpanam, text 27 and 28. There is a story that some sannyasi went to a householder because a sannyasi begs from householders. They are not beggars. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Just begin, begin your charity. So similarly, when Krishna asked me, asked... Maharajji, we did not hear your voice for, a, um, for some time there. It was all blank. Similarly, when Krishna asked, give me a little flower, a little... He's just, just infusing it to the practice of, of 
offering everything that belongs to him. Yeah, that's Madhiji. Unfortunately, we heard about half what you read. Your voice was just, it broke, and there was no sound. Anyway, I think you. Huh? I think I think you can all read it for you. Have you all? This to be read again. No, I, I think you've all read it. You should have read it yourself by now. Anyway, it's a well-known story. That the beggar comes, and the woman wants. She doesn't have. She just said, "I'll give you ashes." And so the sannyasi said, "Okay, just give me ashes." Why? Why? Because, because he's thinking, well, at least she's starting to give. So that's something, that's the beginning. Doesn't matter what she gives, the fact that she's giving something, even though it's useless, is good. So that's the point. So it's the practice of offering. That's, that's a good thing. Okay, there's another Someone please read this one. These calm karmis are attached to the specific work they perform. To them, Krishna therefore says that whatever you are already doing, do that as an offering to me. First perform the activity and then surrender its fruit to Krishna. Bhakti is different. In Bhakti, we first surrender to the order of the Guru then Krishna and then act. We make no distinction between the activity and its fruit. Everything is offered in surrender to Krishna's lotus feet. Surrender on the Alright, so that's the difference between karma yoga and bhakti yoga. Karma yoga, we work first and then we surrender some portion of the fruit. But bhakti yoga, we first surrender. And then we follow the order of Guru and Krishna. All right, we'll go ahead. Text 28 was describing about uh, being freed from the bondage of work, from, it, from what's auspicious and inauspicious. And Lord Krishna said, with your mind fixed on me in this principle of renunciation, you will be liberated and come to me. So Krishna is encouraging Arjuna, encourage, encouraging the devotee, work and at the same time fix your mind on him. So we heard that also in the eighth chapter, Krishna said there also that he, Arjuna should fix his mind on him and fight. So here again, text 28, Krishna is saying, work with your mind fixed on me. In this principle of renunciation, you will be liberated. Now text 29, a nice verse. Samoham sarva bhuteshu name dvesho stima priya ye bhajanti tumam bhaktya maite teshu chapyaham I envy no one, nor am I partial to anyone. I am equal to all. But whoever renders service unto me is in devotion, is a friend, is in me, and I am also a friend to him. So, you can see the first part of the verse. This is a, a statement to everyone. Krishna says, I envy no one. I am equal to everyone. I am equal to all. So that's the first part of the verse. But then the second part of the verse is more specific and it's related to the devotees. Krishna is speaking to the devotees. First part, he's speaking to everyone, all living entities. But second part is for the spe especially for the devotees. Whoever renders service to me is a friend, is in me, and I am also a friend to him. We have some quote from Prabhupada. Oh, oh. Now, sometimes people ask us about this, that uh, how, is it, how is it possible that Krishna is equal to everyone then? If he's giving special attention to his devotees. 
why he's so attached to his devotees. He said he's equal to everyone. But Srila Prabhupada argues, Srila Prabhupada said, well, this is natural. He said it's natural that a woman likes children, but she has a special affection for her own child. And the same way Lord Krishna has special affection for his devotees. It's just natural. Krishna takes a special interest in his devotees. Because the devotees have engaged in his service, so Krishna has a special interest in them. And Prabhupada said, that's not discrimination, it's natural. Somebody may be very charitable, but still he will have a special interest in his own family. So Krishna is kind to everyone. He's like a cloud, pours water everywhere, but he gives special attention for the devotees. And when they are pure devotees, then Krishna has a very special attention for them. Krishna said earlier, as you surrender unto me, I reward you accordingly. Yeyatamam prapadyante tams tataiva pajamiham. So devotees are always transcendentally situated, so they attract the attention of Lord Krishna. Therefore, Lord Krishna says here, Maite teshu chapyaham. They are in me, they are in me, and I am also in them. They are in me, I am, but whoever renders service unto me in devotion as a friend is in me, and I am also a friend to him. Yes, so this is the result of devotional service. In relation to this, Prabhupada gives the example about the gold ring with the diamond set in it. The gold is very nice, the diamond is also very nice. And when the two of them together, then it's a very perfect combination. In the same way, the devotees are like the gold ring and Krishna is like the diamond. And so together, the devotees with Krishna combination is very nice. Krishna becomes a devotee of the devotees. He says, I am in, he's a friend, I am also a friend to him. Krishna is a devotee of his devotees. So this is personal philosophy. In the impersonal philosophy, there, would, there wouldn't be this kind of a reciprocation. It's only in the personal relationships that this, this caring, this friendship will be there. Impersonalism, there's nothing like that. Just oneness, no individuality. Is it clear? Any questions? Okay, we'll go on. Text number 30. Another important verse. Who would like to read it? Go ahead, Prabhu. Even if one commits the most abominable action, if he is engaged in devotional service, he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated in his determination. Alright, so this is a, a, a very special feature of Krishna's relationship with his devotees. That a devotee 
Someone is a devotee, he's engaged in devotional service, but he does the most abominable action. Sudurachara, right? Durachar, the most abominable thing. Sudurachar. So, how could he be a devotee? Well, it happens. It happens that sometimes a devotee, he will do sometimes the most abominable action. But we should understand, he won't do it again and again and again. But some, somehow it may happen just by some force of circumstance, some sit, spe, very special, sometimes situation, somehow or other, he may do something which was not actually of his nature. So, if he is engaged in devotional service, he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated in his determination. Where is his determination? His determination is to be a devotee, to engage in devotional service. That is his determination. Now, sometimes we, we, we do get controversies in our Krishna consciousness movement sometimes, centered around this kind of statement. You know, what constitutes a devotee? Who is actually the devotee and, and to what degree can he be a devotee? Sometimes. There was one devotee. I won't tell you any names or anything. There was one devotee some years ago. And so he was he somehow he had some he had some relationship with other men. You know? In other words, you know not with women, but with men, you know, I had some connection like that with men. So, is that, that's certainly an, ab an abominable action. But at the same time, he's a devotee. And he's a devotee, and he's determined to be a devotee. So, yeah, all right, he's determined to be a devotee. But it's, it's more serious if they're in a very elevated position, if they have the position like a, being a sannyasi or a spiritual master initiating people, then it becomes con very controversial. What is allowed? How much do we tolerate? How much room do you give a person like that? Who has that? Not that kind of past. Mm -hmm. You can understand the situation. Now some people feel very strongly about it. They feel, oh no, no, we can't have people like this as spiritual teachers. We can't have them as, I don't know, sannyasis or whatever. Anyway, these things are, sometimes they come up and, you, and they have to be discussed. But here in this chapter, certainly Lord Krishna, uh, he is expressing his mood in that, he, he, that they're devotees and they shouldn't be rejected, that they are devotees. Everybody understand? Yes? Everybody understand? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. So, uh, in this case, suppose uh, a, 
that sannyasi or a devotee, if he, is, if he has done the mistake once and he has accepted it and then he is ready to improve, it is fine. But somebody is repeatedly uh, committing these mistakes, uh, then still uh, Krishna is uh, ready to render his mercy. Uh, yes, that has to be considered. Uh, there are different statements by different acharyas. They say different things in this matter. It's, you know, I'm not able to give a decision on this. But let's hear just what Lord Krishna has to say and what the Acharyas also say in this matter. Certainly when you have an institution, then these things are very significant. Here's Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's comments on it. Someone please read. My attachment to my devotee is my very nature. That attachment does not decrease even if the devotee commits wrong, for I make him come up to the highest standard. If someone with bad conduct, addicted to violence, thievery, or adultery, Sudurachara, worships me and worships no one except me, and does not follow any other process like karma or jnana, and has no other desire than my desire, Ananyabha, he is my devotee, Adi. But considering his bad conduct, who is he, a, how is he a devotee? He is to be respected, Mantabya, as a devotee because of his devotee qualities. It is a command. Not doing so is offense. My order is the authority. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So Krishna, so he's my devotee, definitely. So that's the main point. Of course, if you have an institution and someone has a position, what is his... <laughs> How it affect, does it affect that? That's another matter. Right? Please read. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur continues. Yes? So he should be considered a devotee in that portion where he worships you. And as a non-devotee in that portion where he commits adultery? No. He should be considered as a devotee, Eva. In all his parts, you should not see his bad qualities at all. He is completely convinced. Samyak Vyavastita. He makes a splendid resolution. I will go to the hell. I will go to hell for my sinful actions, which, which are hard to give up. But I will not give up dedicated worship of Krishna. So, this, you see the statement here, I will go to hell for my sinful actions. So, it seems it's not just a one time thing. And he's saying, which are hard to give up. <laughs> and so it seems to me, well, he hasn't given up this bad habit yet. It doesn't, it's not just mentioned as a, a chance, one-time thing, but it seems like to be a, something which was happening several times. But at the same time, I will not give up dedicated worship of Krishna. So, you can see some difference there how it's presented. Hmm? Yes, go ahead, read more. Someone else read. Bhagavad Gita 9.30 purple. On the other hand, one should not misunderstand that a devotee in transcendent devotional service can act in all kinds of abominable ways. This verse only refers to an accident due to the strong power of material connections. Okay, Devotion just a minute, just a minute. So Pr Pr Prabhupada is making the point here. Th this verse only refers to an accident due to the strong power of material connections. Hmm? So one should not misunderstand a devotee in transcendent, can act in all kinds of abominable ways, of course. We can't, exp 
we can't we should expect a devotee to behave like a gentleman the behavior the standard of behavior must be very proper this verse only refers however this verse refers to an accident due to the strong power okay go ahead Maharaji. Devotional service is more or less a declaration of war against the illusory energy. As long as one is not strong enough to fight the illusory energy, there may be accidental fall downs. But when one is strong enough, he is no longer subjected to such fall downs as previously explained. No one should take advantage of this verse and commit nonsense and think that he is still a devotee. If he does not improve in his character by devotional service, then it is to be understood that he is not a high devotee. All right. So, so this is the point. If he does not improve in his character by devotional service, in other words, if he continues to fall down, if he continues to display, to have these bad tendencies, as, uh, to display the abominable habits, then it should be understood that he is not a high devotee. We shouldn't think that he's still a... No one should take him and, and commit nonsense and think that he is still a devotee. So if you commit nonsense, then what kind of devotee are you? Of course, you're, you're not a devotee. You can't do nonsense. For regulative principles have to be strictly followed. And that that is minimum standard. That is for all civilized people, whether they're practicing devotional service or not. It's a basic standard of behavior for cult for civilized people. So they have to be have to be strictly observed. So if one's not following even these basic principles, then something seriously wrong. So a person is not a very high devotee, that's the point. All right, let's do some group work here. How many people do we have in the class today? How many people are here? Maharaj, we have 25 participants and oh. some there may be more than two. 25 people are here? Okay, some are more. Yeah. Alright, so uh, we have, we want to make some groups. Let's have groups of maybe five people. Can we have five people in five groups? And you can discuss in small groups to study verses 30, 32, 34 and purports and identify what is the mood of Srila Prabhupada in these verses. How did Srila Prabhupada exemplify this mood through practical activities? And what do we learn about pushing forward Srila Prabhupada's mission? Okay. Is it clear? So you all have the same verses. We want you to study, you know, you've, you have five people in each group. So you can split the verse and take a verse each and pick out the, see if you can come up with what is Prabhupada's mood in these verses. Okay, Prabhu, yes.
Maharaj, we can begin. Okay. Yes, if everyone's ready, we can close the group. So we'd like to hear from, let's see, group number one. Do we have a spokesman? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Madhiji. Could you tell us uh, how, what you discussed and what you think was Srila Prabhupada's mood in these verses? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, starting with verse 30, which talks about Api Chaves to Guru Acharya, that if a person commits the most abominable action, he is engaged in devotional service and he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated in his determination. So, in this, the part A of the uh, exercise, which talks about Prabhupada's mood, is in these verses, is the first verse 30, talks about acceptance. That Prabhupada accepted everyone as his disciples, even we see in the moment that there were many fall downs initially. But then, when those devotees came back, Prabhupada accepted them and did not discriminate between uh, those who had fallen down and those who were already practicing. So, and then, uh, and then there is another thing that Prabhupada writes in this uh, thing that a devotee should be cautious that he does not do anything that could disrupt the whole condition. So, there are two aspects that there may be temporary fall down in a devotee, but that doesn't disqualify him. At the same time, a devotee should be cautious also to his devotional service that he does not do anything wrong, that the whole thing becomes, uh, that the whole thing is disrupted. So the acceptance and the temporary fall down, Prabhupada talks about uh, both of these things in these verses. The acceptance, the acceptance, acceptance of devotees. Acceptance of, acceptance of devotees, those who have fallen down. That uh, Prabhupada writes here that there may be temporary fall down of devotees, but that does not disqualify him to perform devotional service. Uh -huh. Because Krishna is in the heart, situated in the heart, he purifies and excuses him. But that does also does not mean that he should be careless in performing. He should be careful in performing, but if there are any accidental fall down, one should not uh, consider the person to be a non-devotee or you know, disqualify that devotee. If there are accidental fall downs, one should forgive them and Temporary fall downs does not disqualify them. Mm -hmm. So Prabhupada talks about uh, both the aspects that one has to be cautious. At the same time, uh, if there is temporary fall down, accept still accept them as devotees. Okay. Yes. So this That's text the thirty. Thirty. Yes. And then about uh, should Maharaj should I go ahead with thirty two or the well we give it to other group? I'm 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 I my thinking is that there's a common mood between the three verses. There's a common mood to be understood, which is there in each of the verses. It's not that the mood is different in each verse, but there's a, a, there's, there's a theme there, which is prominent in the purport. Uh, acceptance of devotees in accidental fall down, and there is no discrimination between higher and lower, uh, like in Vaishya, Shudra, verse number 34, or th 32, sorry. Okay, L let's hear from another group. It's, okay, okay, uh, 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 Yes, thank you. L let's hear from another group. Uh, would, would you could tell us what you discussed and some conclusions you've come to? Group number two? Yes. Okay, Prabhu, go ahead. So, so Maharaj, uh, what after reading uh, the verses from all of, all the three uh, verses, the purpose, so we uh, find that you know Prabhupada has been so merciful. Uh, he's been merciful to the devotees, uh, to the known devotees, even those you know even those who are even at the level of chandas. So he's uh, Prabhupada is ensuring that in uh, verse, how do we get to know about this? In verse thirty. Uh, you know, when we are in devotion, so we are very uh, strict about our regulatory principles. Maharaj, even sometimes, uh, you know, like the Chatur Mas is going on, so we take to some austerities, additional austerities we take. And sometimes their conditions are so, uh, you know, that 
we are not able to follow uh, on our day one two. So we feel very bad about it. We feel very guilty about it that uh, we could not follow this particular thing. So I mean, just in the Modi community, even this happens that they are so strict about their rules. Forget about some abominable actions. So Prabhat is so being so merciful that it should not happen that you know by uh, doing some act. Someone who is a devotee, you know, he slides away from the devotion. So Prabhupada is assuring here so mercifully that even if by accident you commit something which you were not supposed to do, stay assured, uh, get into your devotion. That was by accident, and it is you know due to the clutches of Maya. So rest assured that, but come back to the devotion and do not commit the mistake again. So that is the mercy of uh, Prabhupada. Even the same thing continues uh, in the upcoming verses, uh, as in we see in verse number thirty-two. So, uh, though in the translation it is mentioned that you know the shudra, the vaishas, and, the, and even the you know uh, sprees, so even they get delivered. Prabhat, you know, takes it to Shrimad Bhagavatam and quotes the verse, you know, where even the chandal, I mean, that is the that is considered to be the lowest of the mankind. So even those people they get delivered and Prabhupada is bringing and highlighting you know uh, this Guhyatam thing even in Bhagavad Gita so many people around the world if we look at it like this that many people around the world read Bhagavad Gita they do not get to know about the secret of Srimad Bhagavatam by reading Bhagavad Gita but when they read when they read the purpose, purpose written by Shri, uh, Shri Prabhupada so they get to know oh my god that even you know, if someone is at the level of Chandal, can, you know, get the mercy of the Lord. If uh, he does devotion, if he chants the, you know, holy name, even by accident. So, if we go to verse number 34, so I again find, you know, that uh, merciful mood uh, of Shri Prabhupada. So. <clears throat> okay, yes, that's good. The merciful yeah, mood, so we'll Prabhupada's merciful mood to every to the devotees, even they fall down or they're from very low backgrounds, but Prabhupada's very accommodating them. Yes. Yes, Mara. So even in verse thirty-four, uh, Prabhupada is being so merciful that he saves you know genuine readers in of uh, Srimad Bhagavad Gita from the unscrupulous uh, you know authors and commentators of Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada is saying very clearly that, look, this is very clearly written here, that one should uh, do devotion. So why, uh, you know, other people who are, who are profiteering in mind, who are profiteering by nature, why should they take advantage and why should they write unauthorized commentary? So he wants to save us. He wa Maybe if he would not have been, uh, you know, into devotion and, and into scorn, maybe we would have been reading, you know, uh, purpose by some... Uh, you know, Mayavadi commentators, and we would be thinking, yeah, this is right. But after reading, you know, uh, the Bhakti Vedanta books, we get to know, and one gets a very clear thing from here that we should, you know, refrain from reading unauthorized commentary and commentary by some unscrupulous people. So, this is how our group uh, concluded, Maharaj, that uh, we find the mood of Srila Prabhupada being very merciful, not just to the devotees, but to everyone even to the chandra to the entire man yes is good yes the other any other group would like to contribute something more in this section about the mood of Srila Prabhupada yes Maharaj yes, uh, yes we are from group number 5 Maharaj yes Thank please you. Prabhu yes yeah uh, Prabhu uh, after reading it Prabhu like in text number 30 Prabhu Prabhupada uh, uh, stated the uh, purpose that <coughs> there may be accident accident fall down in our uh, in during our devotional service we, we are, because we are already conditioned human being so we may while doing some activity uh, like performing day-to-day -day activities in our spiritual life maybe in grass or maybe in any kind of brahmachari like any kind of ashram we may have some accidental fall down but it is not a free license that uh, but like we can do anything by by having a tagline of a devotee so we must we must be very careful in doing any kind of devotional service or performing any kind of austerities so, uh, uh, so Maharaj, in while doing the devotional service, we have to uh, very careful that uh, we should not uh, uh, involve ourselves indirectly or directly in uh, any kind of bad activities which is depicting our devotional service in the wrong manner. 
like uh, sometimes uh, devotees do, uh, what they do that uh, they are acting as a devotee in, in a very good manner but uh, they are we can we can say they are acting acting like a devotee but they are not actually a devotee <laughs> Oh. And uh, Maharaj also like uh, when uh, in text number 32 uh, that where Prabhupada says that uh, there is no discrimination between any kind any classes of men. So when we when we, after reading all these uh, three uh, three verses, we we find out that uh, there is a emphasis on uh, continuous devotional service. Uh, like how we can uh, do the devotional service continuously by all thinking only about Krishna. Uh, doing everything, uh, considering Krishna as the supreme, uh, considering day-to-day uh, -day activities uh, by linking with Krishna only, then there is very less chance of, uh, you know, uh, involving uh, ourselves in bad activities. Because uh, we can use Krishna name, we can use uh, as a devoted tagline to do some bad, bad activities also, which comes in the, uh, the uh, offense of the ten, of, uh, ten, ten offenses of uh, Harinam. Uh, uh, Hari so that is also a one of the part where people uh, normally misuse the name of Krishna or, or a devotee. Uh -huh. Yes, good. Yes, the very nice points. I appreciate this. Uh, I, I'm glad to hear you mention about the, the power of Krishna, connecting to Krishna. So the fact that Prabhupada has great faith in the, in the, the power of devotional service that just simply by engaging in the devotional activities that the, the, the devotees can be elevated and corrected and purified from their bad habits. One thing is by the, the power of the process of bhakti yoga and the other is by the instructions of the pure devotee as well. The, the, with the the, the pure devotee, Srila Prabhupada himself, with his personal directions, that that is also going to be a big factor in helping to save people from the, you know, from their bad karma or from their low birth or whatever. The Prabhupada can, just by their connection to him, they can, he can elevate them. And we see this in the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had a servant called Govinda. So Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was surprised he, and he, he thought, uh, how is it that Ishwara Puri could have a servant who was a Sudra? But Prabhupada points out that the, Govinda may have been a Sudra, but once he came took shelter of Ishwara Puri and accepted initiation from Ishwara Puri, then by his initiation he's immediately raised from Sudra level, he's a, he comes to the level of a Brahmana by his initiation from the bona fide spiritual master. So Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, because he was from the smarter background, he was saying, you know, Govinda, he, he can't be a servant of a sannyasi, he's a sudra. But they said, no, he's a brahmana because he took initiation from a bona fide spiritual teacher. So the power of this, the spiritual master to elevate people from the low birth and the power of devotional service to reform the character also. So these two things, Prabhupada had a great faith in uh, giving that opportunity to, the, to people, people who came to him for shelter. He didn't turn them away. If he saw that they were sincere and to follow his instructions, then he gave them the chance. And as you pointed out, sometimes people would fall down. But if they came back, Prabhupada would reinstate them. Okay. Any other points in relation Maharaj, to yes? Maharaj, I I have a question or a point also. Both we can say, uh, Maharaj, uh, like in our day-to-day -day life, uh, we are not very strong enough. We are in a level of uh, Kanishth Adhikari or uh, Kanishth Adhikari or we can say like Madhya Adhikari. But <coughs> Maharaj, we are not yet strong enough. So we can have some accidental fall downs in our life, day-to-day -day life. Yes. So, uh, uh, Prabhupada also says that uh, if we rise up again in the devotional service, if we start doing the devotional service again, 
then we may, we can rise we can rise up to the level of uh, uttam adhikari or we can say we can go up upward up in the upward direction we can develop in our spiritual life right maharaj <coughs> well uh, I, I saw one letter which was written Prabhupada wrote to one devotee the devotee was describing he said that you know, I have a nice relationship with the devotees, but I don't have the same kind of respect for people who are not devotees. So Srila Prabhupada explained to him about Kanista and Madhyam and Uttama, and he said, yeah, he said, he said, we're generally, he said, we may be Kanista, but we should come up to the intermediate level. He said, that is the good level to be. He said, don't, he said to, to go to Uttama, that is for great souls like Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Lord Nityananda, Prahlad Maharaj, these kind of devotees. He said it's not possible to get up to the Uttama level just by your own efforts. You need special blessing from the Supreme Lord Himself. So he said just be happy if you can come up to the intermediate level. That is very good and that is a nice level for practicing devotional service. But to come to Uttama, you know, to see everyone as a devotee, that's very high level and you need special mercy from Krishna to come up to that kind of level. Is that okay, Prabhu? Yes, definitely. And so, the intermediate level, is a, that's a level in which we can practice Krishna consciousness. Okay, so Srila Prabhupada's mood in these verses. And then how did Srila Prabhupada exemplify this mood? Through practical activities. Would someone, have you got some suggestions? <coughs> Maharaj, Prabhupada engaged everyone in devotional activities or devotional service in spite of a person being in low caste, high caste, women, chandala, kilometers. And he gave diksha to everyone in spite of their uh, birth discrimination. So, and he engaged everyone in starting from children to old age and caste, creed, everything. He engaged everyone in uh, devotion to Well, he gave diksha to everyone who would follow the regulated principles and who would chant 16 rounds. 16 rounds. Yes. If they didn't chant 16 rounds, if somebody said, oh, I'm only chanting 12 rounds, then Prabhupada said, then come back when you chant 16 rounds. <laughs> Prabhupada was quite insistent on that. He didn't want to compromise. Yeah, if somebody said, oh, I'm only doing four, three principles, then Prabhupada should do four principles, then you can be initiated. So, Prabhupada didn't just want to have a lot of cheap followers. But he wanted that they would actually follow the vows. We make these vows and that, that we have to have the standard. Some pe sometimes people say, oh, 16 rounds is too many. If we just have to chant four rounds or eight rounds, it will be better. But then that four rounds will also change. We'll say, oh, why four rounds? Better, we just do one round a day. <laughs> they end up, they won't do any rounds. They will end up, be, they won't do any chanting. And so Prabhupada was very strict. He didn't want to, minim to compromise on these things. Yeah, and similarly, people say four principles is too strict. If we have three principles, we can have many devotees. Yeah, you can have many people, but you won't have any pure devotees. Nobody will become a pure devotee. But if they follow four principles, then everyone's a pure devotee. Then this, is, this movement is meant for pure devotees. Everyone's supposed to be a pure devotee. But if we compromise, then we'll just, we'll just become a social organization. We won't be spiritual because there'll be no pure devotees. Nobody following, nobody following the principles. And so everybody will be engaging in sinful activities. But the idea is to stop the sinful activities. So Prabhupada didn't compromise on the, these things. Yeah? So some other points about Prabhupada exemplifying the mood? 
You gave some. Can we hear more about the women? What did Prabhupada allow women to do, and how, how did he accommodate women in the movement? Even women were allowed to uh, perform uh, deity worship. He gave uh, spiritual Anything else women did? Preaching. Preaching, yeah. Book distribution. They would go out on book distribution. They would distribute the books to. Reading Kirtan Maharaj. Yes, yeah, sometimes, sometimes also women would read Kirtan. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I, I, I was I am reminded of uh, an incident uh, regarding women uh, and Prabhupada. So it so happened that uh, pra during this morning walk, uh, Prabhupada met a Sanyasi who, who was like, you know, associating with women, one should not associate with women. And so eventually they went to the nearby temple when Prabhupada went, so the Sanyasi also went along with him. He was not from the movement, the sannyasi was not from the movement. And uh, so when they reached there, so Yamuna Mataji and other devotees, they welcomed them. So then Prabhupada told that sannyasi one thing that, you know, you're telling me so much things about women. Now, uh, understand, please understand this thing. If you associate with these women, your sannyas will attain perfection. So this is what I learned, uh, you learned in a lecture uh, by Mukhila. So. By who? By uh, Amok Lila Prabhu. I, I heard in a lecture by his place Amok Lila Prabhu. Uh -huh. Okay. I don't know. I never heard this pastime before. Anyway, uh, I don't know. One time there, there was a couple of ladies who went off to do some preaching and they arranged a program for Prabhupada. You know, they'd gone to Jaipur and they had arranged some programs there for Prabhupada. And the first Prabhupada was very pleased. But when Prabhupada went there, then he started to see things wrong. You know, there was different faults that women had done. And Prabhupada pointed out, he said, it would be better that, you know, you don't try to do things independently. It would be better if you can work together with the men because you do need some guidance. And so that was an incident which happened. But Prabhupada was certainly appreciative. There was a, sometimes when Prabhupada would do Pandal programs and the crowd would be very noisy, you know, a lot of talking and Prabhupada would be trying to give lecture. So they, they, they would all make so much noise, they wouldn't be attentive. So at that time Prabhupada would invite this one woman, Hemavati, to come. And she would come on the stage and she, as soon as she would come on the stage and talk and immediately all the people would be quiet, <laughs> you know. Just the presence of a woman, a young Western woman on the stage talking to everyone. And then they immediately give so much more attention to her. So Prabhupada utilized women like that. He saw that Western women certainly had a, uh, some charisma, some attractive powers to captivate the minds of the men. <laughs> and Prabhupada used them for his preaching. And he also saw how the women distributed a lot of books. They did a lot of preaching work. And just as the men would go out, they would also go out and distribute. And just as the men would get difficulties, sometimes different authorities, sometimes the police even, like that, so the same would happen to the ladies. And the ladies would accept all these difficulties for the service of Srila Prabhupada. So they they accepted all of these kind of austerities as devotional Prabhupada, So Prabhupada certainly appreciated the women in the movement. At the same time, Prabhupada never appointed any ladies as GBC, and we didn't see any ladies as temple presidents in Prabhupada's time. Of course, one reason may be that because the women were all young ladies at the time, 
women were all younger. Nowadays you've got much more older ladies and the women who take up these positions are much more older and senior. So in Prabhupada's time the ladies were mostly all young ladies, so it was not certainly understandable why they wouldn't become temple presidents and GBC. But in Prabhupada, after Prabhupada's gone, they're much more mature. So we see we do have, we have ladies temple presidents and ladies also even on the GBC. So the final sec, anything else you like to add about Prabhupada, practical activities? Apart from women? Krishna Guru Maharaj, what about the women who taught in Gurukulas? They were teaching children in the Gurukulas and all that? Well, of course, ladies would teach the, the young girls. You need young ladies to take care. You need ladies to take care of the young girls, and the men would take care of the young boys. And, but some ladies would teach in the guru home. Usually, it was mostly men teaching in the guru home. Uh, Prabhupada taught us about distributing prasada. Certainly, he, 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 he didn't like that if the devotees would just go to the poor areas and give food to the poor people. He said, well, the rich people also need prasada too. He said, they own, also need to be encouraged to take up devotional service. So he said, don't just pick the poor areas to go and distribute food. You don't just want to give it to the poor people. You want to give to everyone. You want to attract people of all levels, all levels of society. So it's not that uh, prasadam distribution is just uh, feeding the poor or a welfare program. It's a spiritual program and everyone needs to get spiritually elevated. So that was Prabhupada's vision of equality. Hmm. At one time, a devotee in Los Angeles, they were thinking that they would make a special entrance into the temple so that people could keep their shoes on. They were thinking, it's too much trouble. <coughs> oh, excuse me. It's too much trouble for Western people to have to take their shoes off all the time to come into the temple. So he, th he wanted to make an entrance to the temple where they could come in without taking their shoes off. But Prabhupada didn't encourage that. He said, no, no. He said, that's not the standard. I said, if they want to come into the temple, they have to take off their shoes. This is, we're not going to make some adjustments just so they can keep their shoes on. Okay, any other things? Okay, um, yes, Prabhu? Yeah, Prabhupada also taught us about the, uh, how we can cultivate the knowledge of Krishna continuously. With the making the favorable cultivation with the help of a bona fide spiritual master. Yes, the the help of the that's very important. That the that is Prabhupada's mood that the you need to have the bona fide spiritual master there to give the instruction and to guide us and to tell us what we need to do to progress and how to practice Krishna consciousness. And so the, the guidance of the spiritual master is essential. The purity of the devotional service and the, the guidance coming from the pure devotee, very important. And that was what made the difference to people of all, you know, low caste and bad habits and abominable activities. That is what saves them.
and brought them, kept them in Krishna consciousness. So what do we learn about pushing forward Srila Prabhupada's mission? Any realizations? Any thoughts on this? Yes? Maharaj, Krishna consciousness is the only means of being delivered from the clutches of this contaminated material world. Oh, very nice. Yes, good. The, the, the potency which is there in the Krishna consciousness movement is unique. It's not found in any other path, any other spiritual process. No ritualistic activities, no kinds of atonement other than Krishna consciousness are going to save people from the hellish civilization. One should therefore engage his mind in the eternal form, the primal form of Krishna, with conviction in his heart that Krishna is the supreme, he should engage himself in worship. Okay. Yeah, we have to have full faith in Lord Krishna. We have to dedicate ourselves fully to the service of Krishna. And one must engage in the nine different processes of devotional service, beginning with hearing and chanting about Krishna. Uh -huh. Okay. So pushing forward Srila Prabhupada's mission means... It is, uh, Maharaj, it is above uh, the speculative knowledge or mystic yoga and fruitive activities which Prabhupada has said. Yes. I'm, I, I like to hear your own words about it, how your actual feeling, your realization about what do we learn about pushing forward Prabhupada's mission. I think one thing we learn is that we have to be merciful, we have to be a inclusive rather than exclusive. Our doors have to be open to everyone. We have to be willing to accommodate people, even though we may not feel, you know, so happy about it. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you get, you know, groups. This person, no, he's not from our community, he's from some, you know, and, and just like in, in, in America, you know, you have black people and you have white people and sometimes there's conflicts between the black people. Sometimes the black people feel the white people are prejudiced against them. This kind of thing. And so we have to push forward Prabhupada's mission without these kind of problems. We have to bring everybody above the bodily platform. Some, you know, we get groups of people they're eth maybe they're ethnic Tamils or they're ethnic Chinese or whatever, you know. They, they don't mix well with other people from outside their community. And they think Krishna consciousness, this is only for our community, you know. And so with Prabhupada's mission it was very open, it was very inclusive for everyone. And so we want to welcome everyone into Krishna consciousness, give them the opportunity to take part. Krishna, uh, yeah. Yes. Krishna, yes. Can we also say, Maharaj, that uh, from Maharaj, you just said now that uh, we we should we keep the doors open for any kind of people who are coming to the society. So there are lots of people who are performing. Uh, if, abominable actions also or sometimes they are uh, due to their accidental fall downs they are doing some bad activities also so we must be very merciful that uh, we, should, we should be very welcoming in nature we should uh, allow them to perform the devotional service so uh, uh, step by step they will be able to improve in their devotional service yes then, that's yes. the principle in preaching that first of all get them attached to krishna and gradually give them the rules and regulations. The rules and regulations come later. But the first thing is to get them attached to Krishna. 
And gradually then we introduced the different rules and reg regulations. That was Prabhupada's method of preaching. And get them attached to Krishna. And Krishna, Krishna's holy name, Krishna's pusadam, and Krishna's teachings. And gradually introduce the different rules and regular principles. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. So another thing what uh, uh, Prabhupada has increased in his period is when we are going for preaching or spreading this Krishna consciousness they allowed people to take risks. Like even in his time he himself gone to Russia, which was not a very favorable place. Even Africa, when we have different part of Africa where people were quite violent, so he allowed uh, the preaching to continue over there. Even in the beginning, he faced resistance in Australia, and even he has sent the devotees to Pakistan and uh, many of the Muslim countries. And now we have uh, uh, full-fledged activities going on in Middle East countries. And very recently, like even Bangladesh, where we have recently faced, uh, uh, even it is ongoing violence. So, but even in those situations also, Prabhupada in his time, he encouraged people to go and do the preaching even at the risk of their life. So, um, so uh, and, and that is what the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also, uh, what he taught us and which we are continuing in the same missions that even most abominable down, uh, uh, there's difficult people who are against our, our uh, uh, philosophy, who are more violent towards us, so still we wanted to uh, keep them the uh, Krishna and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu mercy, though at the uh, risk of our own life and uh, and, and they in fact quite a number of devotees in, in that process they have sacrificed their life and that mission is still which is uh, which has started by Prabhupada and earlier Chaitanya Mahaprabhu we are continuing in the in the same spirit. No, very nice. Are you volunteering? Uh, to the extent, yes, uh, Prabhuji, of course, uh, Maharaj, uh, so wherever I, I got a chance uh, in the last 30, 35 years, I, I, I did that in Africa, I, I did that because we had a manufacturing plant over there where we have 700 black people where, uh, where there, we involved them among Muslims uh, community in our group which we have formed it, we have a quite number of uh, uh, Muslim uh, people also, we, 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 we try to uh, please them about the facts and through them we try to uh, uh, try to tell them that where they are going wrong, what the philosophy they should, they should move so that there will, should be better acceptability in the world, otherwise negative feeling about this particular community, it is not going to do well for, for them in the long run. Okay, so, okay, so we, thank you very much, very nice. Yes, Prabhupada, there was one devotee, Prabhupada told him to go to Russia and he said, Prabhupada, there's no vegetables there. He said, everybody has to eat meat. He said, then eat meat, but go there. <laughs> so Prabhupada had that mood. He, he said, just he, whatever can, we have to do, you know, you go there. You may have to accept some difficulties, but don't avoid the preaching. Yes, we want to go forward. So, it's still many there's still countries open where nobody's gone yet. We're waiting, try to open them up. We need people. There's countries which need devotees to develop, try to develop Krishna consciousness. Of course, it's not easy. It's a lot of risks, but people take risks. You have to be willing to take some risks on behalf of Krishna. Just as Prabhupada took risks to go to America on a boat at the age of 70 with no money. My goodness. No money, no books. <laughs> well, he brought some books. He, bought, he brought his Bhagavatams. Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, text 31. Okay, he quickly becomes righteous and attains lasting peace, O son of Kunti, declare it boldly, my devotee never perishes. So this verse comes uh, 
text, what, text number 30 was describing about the devotee may fall down, he may perform uh, suduracha, right? That he he's uh, engaged in sinful activities. But here, Lord Krishna continues that that devotee, even though he has some abominable habits, but if he's trying to be a devotee, he quickly becomes righteous and attains lasting peace. Declare it boldly, my devotee never perish. The famous statement by Lord Krishna, this kuntiya priti janihi na me bhakta pranashati, that my devotee is not going to perish. So, Lord Krishna is establishing here that that person, although he was fallen, did some bad activity by chance, you know, fell down, but he will quickly reform because he will hate himself, he will feel so guilty about it, he's going to reform his character, he's going to feel very, and he'll feel very concerned to rectify himself. He will condemn himself as being very fallen and sinful, he won't claim himself as being very righteous, but rather he'll consider himself very low-born and fallen. Okay, oh, a big quote here. This Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur. Who would like to read this for us? How can you accept? How can you accept the worship of such a sinful person? How can you eat the food and drink of offered by the heart contaminated by, with lust and anger? Very quickly he becomes righteous. The person, the present is used and not for the not the future to express the fact that having committed sin. By remembering the Lord, he becomes repentant and thus very quickly becomes righteous. Oh, oh, how unfortunate I am. There is no one as low as I, bringing bad name to the devotees, repeatedly successful. He feels completely knee for nirtanam, disgust, sati. Something for those actions, or the use of present tense can indicate that in the future he will develop righteousness fully. But even right now, it exists in a subtle form. After taking medicine through the destructive effects of fever or poison, remains for some time. It is not considered considered seriously. Thus the entrance of bhakti. In this mind, the sinful actions are not taken seriously. Right. Okay. So the sinful actions in his mind not taken seriously. The person in the beginning, the argument was that how could you take food cooked by somebody whose heart's all full of lust and anger? You know, somebody has some lust or anger in the heart, some habit like that. And so are you going to eat food cooked by him? So the other person saying, we don't think we should do that. But the reply is given, well, this person, he may, there may be some lust and anger in the heart, but very quickly he will become righteous, provided he has the right mood, all right? The, then the mood is the described here. He's thinking, I am so unfortunate. There's no one as low as I am. I'm bringing a bad name to the devotees. So he thinks like that. So this is the positive aspect of the, the fallen person. He's very repentant and he quickly become, but so because of his repentance, he will quickly become righteous. So there must be that mood of repentance, that mood that, I, I did wrong, I'm very, I did very bad, I'm very sorry. There must be that mood. And then the final section describing that in the future he will develop righteousness fully. And even right now his righteousness is there subtly. It's just going to take time to fully manifest. And the example is given, given like the person takes medicine. So the effect of the medicine will take some time before the, 
gets over the fever or the, the poison or whatever. So the same way the bhakti or the righteousness will come with time. It just, it's going to take a little time. And the sinful action shouldn't be taken seriously. Yes? Please read. Someone else read? Go ahead. And the traces of sin, which uh, such as lust and anger should be considered insignificant, like the biting of a toothless snake. Thus he attains nigachati, complete cessation of lust and anger, shanti, permanently ashwat. In nigachati, ni stands for uh, nitaram, completely. This means that even during the stage of having tendency to commit sin, he has a pure heart. If he eventually becomes righteous, there would be no argument. However, if a devotee is sinful right up till his death, what is his position? The Lord, the Lord affectionate to his devotees, then speaks loudly with a little anger. O oh, son of Kunti, my devotee is not destroyed. At the time of death, he does not fall. But arguers with harsh tongues will not respect this. Krishna then encourages the worried, lamenting Arjuna, O oh, Kanteya, going to the scrabbling assembly with a tumultuous sound of drums, throwing your hands in the air, you should fearless declare this. All right, declare what? That my devotee does not perish. Right, that's right. Krishna is telling Arjuna, you go and declare it. With the sound, take your drums and cymbal, beat the drums, call everyone and call out loudly. Declare it, the devotee will never perish, right? Why does Krishna tell Arjuna to do this? Because he would, in any condition, keep the words of his devotee. He may break his promise, he may, uh, you know, come back on his words, uh, but he will, in any case, uh, you know, ensure that whatever his devotee has uh, promised, he will keep his promise uh, to everyone. Did Krishna break his promise? Uh, yeah, Maharaj, it happened during the Mahabharat war. You know, when uh, Vishnu Pita Maha, he, he took a vow, Krishna had taken a vow that he will not pick up uh, any any of the Shastras. Uh, but uh, on one day when Ma, when Vishnu Pita Maha took the vow that uh, the next day I will kill all the Pandvas. So during that time Krishna broke the promise and kept the promise of uh, his devotee. Uh, he picked up the wheel of a chariot and that way he ensured that he keeps the words of his devotees. He may sometimes uh, you know, come back on his words. Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Yes, Krishna broke his promise to protect Arjuna from the wrath of Bhishma. Yes. Yes, So, the Lord is very affectionate to his devotees. So, he's telling that my devotee is not destroyed at the time of death. He does not fall. And so that's why he's telling Arjuna, you go and declare it to everyone. My devotee will never perish. All right? Uh, it continues a little more. Go ahead, Prabhu. Declare what? Declare what? Declare that my devotee, the devotee of the Supreme Lord, though committing sin, does not perish, but rather reaches success. Arguments defeated, pride deflated, they should undoubtedly respect you as a guru. This is Sridhar Swami's explanation. But why does the Lord order Arjuna to declare this when he could do it himself? As he will say later, Maam Evashyasi Satyam Te Pratijane Priyo Asime. I declare to you that you will truly come to me you are very dear to me, Bhagavad Gita 18.65. In the same way, why does he not now say, 
I declare on there that my devotee does not perish. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a bit more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, Krishna, what happened? Yeah, here it's. Yes, you have to read a bit more, Prabhu. The reason is explained here. The reason is explained here. The Lord considered as follows being affectionate to my devotee and not tolerating even a slight degradation of my devotee. I will, under all circumstances, uphold the declaration made by my devotee. Whereas I can break my own promise and accept criticism of myself, just as in breaking my own promise in fighting with declaration from my mouth, the materialistic disputers will laugh, but they will not. But they will accept Arjuna's declaration as if written on stone. Therefore, I will have Arjuna make the declaration. And thus, one should not accept the statements of the falsely intelligent persons who, after hearing about Ananya Bhakti, even of greatest sinner, think that this declaration made by the pure devotee cannot apply in cases where attachment to wife and children, sinful acts, lamentation, illusion, lust, anger, and other despicable qualities manifest. Okay, so a question for everyone. How could the message of the statement of Lord Krishna, 931, that his devotee never perish, be misunderstood? And what is the actual meaning here? Academic integrity. You know, we often see these things in Bhagavad Gita, they're taken out of context and People don't understand the actual meaning. So what is Krishna's intention when he says, my devotee will never perish? How can we understand this? Yes? Like Maharaj, if we do some bhakti now, and somehow if we are not able to complete, that we will continue in the next life. Okay. So Krishna is saying the what? What's not going to perish? Is bhakti. The devotion, the devotion of the bhakta. Okay, the, the devotion which he has, he'll keep his devotion. Yeah. Uh, a little advancement made saves one from the greatest danger, right? So, in, in this endeavor, there's no loss or diminution. And so somebody does some devotional service is not going to lose whatever service we lost. And we see the example in Srimad Bhagavatam. There's an example. Vrita. Jadbharat. Huh? Who? Uh, Jadbharat. Jadbharat. Well, yeah. Well, Gajendra. Yes. Jadbharat, he became the deer, but he remembered that he'd fallen down. And... Uh, then he was very careful in the future. Uh, the example I was thinking of was Vritasura. Vritasura. Uh, previously he'd been Chitraketu and he was quite advanced. He was advanced, and, but then because of some misunderstanding with Lord Shiva's wife, she had cursed him to become a demon. But although he became a demon, he didn't lose his bhakti. So he had a demon body and he was fighting Indra, but at the same time he had bhakti. And so Indra was, it was a, a great dilemma for Indra to have to fight and kill him, because Indra understood he's a great devotee, although he's in a demon body. <laughs> but it was the arrangement of the Lord to bring Vritasura back to Godhead quickly, that he could finish off his karma. So bhakti is never lost, whatever bhakti one has. So, is that all? Is that what Krishna's actual meaning is here? The devotee will never perish? How, co how could it be misunderstood? What would be the misunderstanding? Hare Krishna Maharaj. So yes. Many cases, uh, 
a devotee pretend to be a devotee of the Lord, but he never uh, give uh, uh, due respect to other devotees. And Krishna always says that those devotees who is uh, uh, who, who is a devotee of my devotee or uh, devotee of uh, uh, that devotee, I, 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 I have more uh, love for them that uh, uh, devotee who is directly worshipping uh, uh, me. So this is one of the things which we always misunderstand that only directly because that's why we have a Guru Shisha Parampara. So we have to, we cannot approach the Krishna directly. So we have to approach the, through our Guru and in turn in so the, uh, his Guru. So that is how it is to be delivered. So thing is we cannot see, think of uh, by this sloka, we cannot think that we can establish a direct connection with the Lord and we uh, uh, dis uh, disrespect the whole Guru Sisha Parampara or other uh, uh, brothers and sister devotees. So probably this is what uh, we always misunderstood from, from this sloka, Maharaj. Oh, you're saying that from this sloka that the devotee will go may think he can go directly to Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. So, so that's a bit because when the Lord says that my devotees does not fall, fall, so always think that my devotees means Krishna devotees directly. So the thing is, even if you are doing it, abominable act to other devotees, uh, uh, so I still. Uh, okay. Lord, yes. Okay. Yes. Very good. Yes. Very nice. Mm. That's a, that could, yes. Uh, uh, maybe uh, it's misunderstood uh, by the impersonalists thinking that they have all the power and uh, they could uh, be immortal. So this is how the uh, statement could be misunderstood, Maharaj. Yes, right. Yet it certainly happens. We get devotees sometimes, you know, Maybe somebody, I remember we had one devotee he took initiation and after a little while he found out he had cancer and it was a, a great blow to him because he thought, you know, I've just become a devotee and I'm just initiated and now I've got this disease, you know, and he, he, it was very hard for him to accept. And he thought, why Krishna didn't protect me? You know, he said, my devotee will never perish, he let me get this disease. So how would you how would you deal with that devotee? What would you tell him? Anyone like to respond? Yeah, please. Uh, Mar Maharaji, uh, so probably we have to tell them that uh, probably uh, Lord love you so much that he want to endure this body and then he want you back early. So, so that is one way of we uh, can give him a positivity that probably uh, his karma was so good and only very a small part was left. So that's the way of ending this, this body. Another thing we can say that by this severe pain of the cancer, probably many of the uh, bad karma will be washed out in one go itself and probably the Lord love you so much that he want you so quickly that all this karma he is trying to uh, uh, get uh, cancelled out with giving a such a severe pain so that he can quickly take you back uh, to his Godhead where, where you have eternal uh, love and pleasure and companionship of the Lord. Yes, very nice Prabhu. Very good. Yes, that's a nice response. Maharaj, could it also be, uh, you know, taken like that, that uh, maybe you were supposed to uh, get a bigger thing, maybe a, a cardiac arrest, but uh, maybe because you are in devotion, uh, you got more time and it is just cancer. Maybe you, you have a hope for revival as well, but uh, I mean, it, it could also be taken that way. Because devotees also that, okay, God saved me from a big thing, I got this, so maybe, I mean, just a small wound is uh, there, and that's why I could be saved. So, it could have been taken that way also much. Oh, okay, yeah. It could have been much worse than it was. <laughs> All right? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, Harikshna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Maharaj, uh, uh, 
in this verse, uh, Krishna is saying that uh, he quickly becomes righteous and attains lasting peace. Uh, o son of Panti, my devotee never per perishes. This is a link link uh, with the previous verse, uh, Maharaj. Yes. Right? Like some, suppose example, I am committing some kind of, I am a devotee, suppose example, I am committing some kind of mistake uh, by, with, uh, with, my, with my material contamination or with any kind of, like, so some, I have involved in some kind of activity. So, uh, uh, slightly or later on I will be, become righteous, but I will no, never perish, a devotee will never perish. Once a person who has become a devotee of Krishna, he will never perish again and he will be come back again in the devotional service by doing the nine, uh, nine process, nine activities of devotional service. Yes. I understood like this, Maharaj. I, I don't know I am right or wrong. No, no, certainly that's right. Yes, certainly. You do devotional service, you come back in devotional service. Yeah. Like if once I have become a devotee, I will never perish. Uh, as a devotee, I will become. I will be the be devote. I will be always a devotee. I will. Maybe I may. I am not good now, but I will become. You know, with the help of uh, association, with the help of chanting, uh, continuous chanting by doing devotional service, uh, I will become again good. Of course, we gave the example of Vritasura. Vritasura took birth in a demon body, but even in a demon body, still he was a devotee. <laughs> And he was just, he was fighting with the demigods, but he was doing it as his, his duty, the sense of duty. He just wanted to get rid of the body. And he was encouraging Indra to kill him, because he knew once he gave up the body, then he would go back to Godhead. Yes. So, Maharaj, bodily pains are not uh, examples of, uh, like, uh, I will be, I will, I will not, I will perish or not perish, like, if I'm, I'm not, because if you are acting in a bodily platform, then we will be very much, you know, upset that I, why Krishna is doing this to me? Why Krishna is giving me uh, uh, many kind of diseases? But if I'm not in a bodily platform, uh, then uh, there will be no, this kind of problem in our life. I mean, we will not think uh, that much. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> like Prabhupada also, uh, he was very sick, but still he, uh, uh, he continuously did his devotional service. Sometimes Maharaj, when we are sick, we try to avoid devotional services. That's why, because we are not uplifted in that level, or we are not trying to become uh, good in our devotional service. We are trying to give some excuse. No. Yes. Yeah. If we try to avoid devotional service, that's certainly not good. Yeah. We should be happy to accept every opportunity of devotional service. Of course, devotional service is done on different levels, is with the body and with the mind and with the words. So we should all we should act on all three platforms, not just only with the body, but we should use our mind and words also in the service of Krishna. Okay. So, someone please read this section here. So, here Krishna says, Kaunteya Pratijanihi, You promised, so I shall protect your promise. Name Bhakta Pranashya. Anyone who has taken to Krishna consciousness will never be destroyed. Name Bhakta Pranashya. Of course, a living entity is never destroyed so far as his constitution is concerned. Na Hanyate Hanyamane Shari. The destruction of this body is not destruction. The real destruction is that if we lose our spiritual consciousness, we can also lose our identity. In our material conception of life, we are practically destroyed because as spiritual beings, we have a blissful eternal life. We have full knowledge, but here we live in rest conditions, feeling that life is not eternal, not blissful and not in full knowledge. So are we already destroyed? <laughs> are we already destroyed? And so. Prabhupada is describing just what you're talking about. If someone's in the bodily conception of life, that's not right. The material world, we're living in wretched conditions and life is not eternal. 
we're not, so we're in the bodily consciousness. Yes? Go ahead, Prabhu. We are picky, we are advancing in civilization, but unless we revive our original life of eternity and full knowledge and bliss, we should know that we are not advancing. We are being defeated by the illusory energy. This is destruction. Destruction of real life is materialism. So here Krishna says, Kaunteya Pratijani. He is declared in the world that anyone who has taken to this Krishna consciousness will never be destroyed. He will never go back again to that material life of sense gratification and to this material existence full of miseries. Lecture on Bhagavad Gita 9.3. Okay, so yes, Prabhupada's making the points as you, some of you had said. We we'll never go back to the material life. <laughs> no, you can never go back. Once we come to Krishna consciousness, I feel like that. I certainly, you know, I, I felt you can never go back to the material world after being in Krishna consciousness. Although there can be challenges in Krishna consciousness, but the material world is so terrible. The material life of sense gratification, so miserable. You can never go back. Why should we go back to that place? Okay. Mami parta vai pasritya, yepi shu papa yonaya. Sriya Vaishyas Tathasudras Tepi Yanti Parangatim. O son of Prita, though they, um, those who take shelter of me, though they be of lower birth, women, sudras, Vaishyas, and they can all attain the supreme destination. So Kali Yuga, we say Kali Yuga, Kalo Sudra Sambhava. In the Kali Yuga, we are all sudra and lower. So. We're all Papa Yonaya. We're we're all pap we're all uh, unqualified. We're all of lower birth. This is our Parabdha Karma that we have this low birth. This low birth. But if we take to Krishna consciousness, then we can attain the supreme destination. That's the important point. Just surrender to Krishna. Take shelter of Krishna and you can come to the supreme destination. Devotional service destroys all the parabdha karma. If we properly, fully engage in devotional service, oh my goodness. Oh yeah, would someone like to volunteer and read this for us? In India, according to the caste system or Varnashrama Dharma, the Brahmana and Kshatriyas are considered to be the highest in the society. The Vaishyas, a little less than them, the Shudras are not taken into account. Similarly, women are classified as Shudra. The thread ceremony is given to the Brahmana, Kshatri and Vaishya, but there is no thread ceremony for a woman. Although a woman may be born into a Brahmana family, she does not have that benefit because Striya, women are seen as less intelligent. They should be given protection, but they cannot be elevated. But here in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna surpasses all these formalities. He is giving opportunities to everyone regardless of birth. In the social structure, you may consider that the woman is less intelligent or a Shudra is less purified. But in spiritual consciousness, there is no such bar. Krishna accepts everyone. It doesn't matter whether you are a woman, a Shudra or a Vaishya. If you simply take to Krishna consciousness, the Lord is there. He will give you all protection and gradually he will help you. One who is in Krishna consciousness is already on the liberated platform, simply Shipram. It will take some time, Shipram, but very soon he will be all right. So this is the proposal of Lord Krishna and this is the facility of Krishna consciousness. Lecture on Bhagavad Gita 9.28. So very clear, that Prabhupada is explaining, Bhagavad Gita surpasses all these formalities. The Vedic culture women are uneducated and low class and everything. <laughs> but the Bhagavad Gita transcends all that. Everyone's given the, the chance. They can all achieve the supreme destination. 
Uh-huh. Yes? Someone else like to read? Even one born into a low-grade family can be elevated without exception. That is Sastra. But there are rascals who do not allow this. They have their own idea. Krishna never said that. Only the Brahmanas or Indians or Hindus can take shelter of me. Mampi Prada Vya Pastritya Ye Abhi Shiv Whatever he may be, there is no restriction. Just like anyone can take bath in the Ganges. It is not that only a particular person or particular community can take a bath. Anyone can and he becomes purified. There is an example, Nahi Harate Jodsna Chandras Chandala Vishmani. When there is moonlight, there is no discrimination that the Bangi's house should receive the moonshine, while at the Chandala's house there should be none. The moon shines upon the palace of the king or on the house of the Chandala. Nahi Harate Jodsna Chandras Chandala Vishmani. Krishna's mercy is for everyone and it it is not restricted to a certain community or class of people. Anyone can take advantage of Krishna consciousness. Conversation, Washington, 1970. Thank you. Prabhupada giving some interesting statements there from the social culture of India, talking about the chandalas and the <laughs> and the bangi, <laughs> bangi meaning the very low-class people. And so Prabhupada is saying Krishna consciousness is for everyone. And giving and supporting it with examples. Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> okay, case one. One famous Indian leader. Na uh, he, he married... What is this? He named all those who were born in lower class families as Harijans, people of God. Evaluate his attempt. What is consistent with Srila Prabhupada's teachings and what is inconsistent? Ask the question, if everyone is equal in the eyes of God, why is there a division of society in four varnas? All right, so this, we know from Gandhi that who, this Mahatma Gandhi, he called the people Harijans, the children of God or people of God. So evaluate his attempt. Was it successful? Did he save the people? Were the Harijans saved? No. No, no Maharaj. No, they were not, right. It created more division. It created more discrimination. They have it. Uh, and uh, unqualified people have been put on, on a just because of to make the uh, creating a level field so that that has created more disharmony that has created more anarchy oh okay so what is consistent with Srila Prabhupada's teachings is there anything which was consistent Srila Prabhupada always says that uh, for for uh, it, it is based on the uh, quality of the persons the uh, work is to be divided because what the foot does hand cannot do and the head cannot do but uh, uh, harmonious functioning of all the organ it is important for a smoother functioning of the uh, of, uh, of the body and so is the society so it is very important that everybody should give due respect to the job what they are doing it uh, and and uh, because everybody is, if they are in Krishna consciousness, whether it is Shudras or Kshatriya or Vasya or Brahmana, all are, uh, if they do uh, uh, bhakti with pure devotion, then they, they can straight away go to Godhead. So like that, for even functioning of the society, there is no point of dividing it and, and giving somebody who is not qualified to giving a reason. Because okay, okay, thank you, thank you, okay. Now that, and ask the question, if everyone is equal in the eyes of God, then why is there a division of society in the four varnas? Everyone is uh, equal. It's according to, according uh, to? Yes. According to one's psychophysical nature, one is 
uh, even if one is not divided, he from the categories as a Brahmana or Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, according to his own psychophysical nature. So mm-hmm. even if uh, externally we don't see that there are people who are not Brahmanas, but there may be people who may be inclined to reading books or doing scriptural uh, devotional things. And okay. Be people will be more inclined to doing services. Okay. What does Krishna say in Bhagavad Gita? How is the four divisions made? The four varnas? I created them. But according to what? Three moods and four According to one's nature. According to guna and karma. Guna and karma. Right. Guna karma Right. Okay, case two. One devotee recently gave the Sunday class lecture before a crowd of 500 people, mainly from the ethnic Hindu community. In so doing, he called the leader, he called the, the leader mentioned above, Mahatma Gandhi, he called him a, a hellish politician, a foolish politician. Many listeners became upset and over a hundred walked out before the class had finished. Evaluate. So, what do you think? If somebody gives a class like that and a hundred people walked out because you call Mahatma Gandhi a foolish politician, how do you... Is point saying like this in the public class? We can discuss these things in the private class, but in the public class we should... Yes, Prabhupada's idea was, Prabhupada's principle was, you criticize the philosophy, you don't criticize the person. You never criticize a person. That is very bad. You can criticize the philosophy. Prabhupada would say, if people would ask Prabhupada, what do you think of this person? Prabhupada would say, what does he teach? What is his philosophy? And then Prabhupada would tackle the philosophy. He would not criticize a person. Okay, now answer the question. If we were asked before a crowd of people, what do you think of Gandhi's attempt to help the untouchables, how, what would you reply? Students might do well to consider how Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nichananda exemplified the first sentence of the purport of verse 32. Yes, what is the first sentence of the purport of text 32? Okay. So, how would you reply? That is clear. What do you think of Gandhi's attempt to help the untouchables? Guru Maharaj, yes. Krishna, I think Gandhi's attempts was more to help, to help only at the material level only, but he did not give them spiritual knowledge, it was not to elevate them spiritually. So this thing about the distinction between lower and higher class, he didn't want to make a distinction between lower and higher class, but only at the material level. Okay. So he was dealing on the material platform, not on the spiritual platform. No. Social political level. Okay. Okay. So that's a good answer. Uh-huh. Anybody else? Outpouring sympathy. Outpouring sympathy for them because of their low birth. Ah. <laughs> mm. Yes? Um, Maharaj. Maharaj. Paitan and Lord Nityananda have exemplified this by giving mercy to Jagai and Madan. Well, Jagai and Madan were from a Brahmin family. Oh. Can you see the example of Haidas Thakur? He was born into a Muslim family, but he was elevated as Namacharya Haridas Thakur. Yes, but Haridas Thakur wouldn't even eat with the, the devotees. He wouldn't go in, couldn't go into the temple, and he wouldn't sit and eat with the devotees. He, you know, kept a look, kept away from, you know, the, the socially. It was like he was socially ostracized. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So, Mahatma Gandhi, he has just named them some class of people as Harijan, but he has not provided them the systematic way of uh, 
how we can become a true devotee of the Lord by uh, changing their abominable practices uh, and which Prabhupada has uh, institutionalized the whole process of how anybody can upgrade it to Vaishnava, uh, 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 who is even higher than Brahmana. So that Mah uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi didn't do the whole institutionalization or process of transformations of people from just naming it does not going to change the characteristics of a person. Okay, yes. Just keep putting the name, putting the label or rubber stamping, they say, it doesn't change the character of the person, right? So, yes, what about Ramananda Rai? By birth, he was a Sudra, right? Yes, he was born in a Shudra family, but Lord Chaitanya gave him so much respect. Yeah, because, because he was rich in knowledge. He was very learned in the scriptures. He knew the science of Krishna. Okay. So then here we have the final verse. Manmana bhava mad bhakto madhyaji mam namaskaru mami vaishyasi yuktai bam atmanam mad parayanaha. Engage your mind always in thinking of me, become my devotee, offer obeisances to me and worship me. Being fully, completely absorbed in me, surely you will come to me. Here's Prabhupada's comment. This confidential service, preaching of Bhagavad Gita is essential. Sarva dharmam parigyajnam mami kam sharanam braja. Simply go and preach. Krishna says, Manmana bhava mad bhakto madhyaji mam namaskuru. It is Krishna's desire that we preach to the world. Just be Krishna conscious. Manmana, just become Krishna's devotees. Manmana bhava mad bhakto madhyaji, just worship Krishna. Madhyaji Mam, just offer your obeisances to Krishna. Four words, then you become a preacher. It is not very difficult to become a preacher and to become a spiritual master. How? It's simple. Go and teach what Krishna says. That's all. You have nothing to make up from a lecture on Srimad Bhagavatam given in Los Angeles in 1973. So, four things, right? Engage your mind in thinking of me, become my devotee, offer obeisances to me, and worship me. So, this is the most confidential knowledge. It comes right at the end of the ninth chapter, right in the middle of the Bhagavad Gita, the very middle of the Bhagavad Gita. How many verses are in the Bhagavad Gita? Do you remember? Right, so this is right in the middle, at the end of the ninth chapter. And Krishna's tell and this verse will come again in the eighteenth chapter. We'll see again Krishna repeats this instruction. The Bhagavad Gita is the essence of all Vedic literature. The middle six chapters are the essence of the Gita and the ninth and tenth chapter are the essence of the middle six chapters. Finally, the last verse of this chapter, which is exactly in the middle of the Gita and which will be repeated practically verbatim at the end of the Gita, is the most confidential and essential sloka. It is the essence of the essence of the essence and the most confidential of all knowledge. Become a pure devotee of Lord Krishna. So this is the most confidential knowledge. Krishna is telling us how to become pure devotee. Four things, right? Engage your mind in thinking of him, worship Krishna, become his devotee, and offer obeisances. 
All right. Are there any questions? Any other points? No? Okay. So thank you very much. And we'll meet you again next week. Thank you. Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada. Jai. Hare Krishna.